Can I welcome everyone to the 24th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2017? And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? Tavi Scott will be joining us this morning, but will be a few minutes late. Uh, Daniel Johnson has given his apologies as he is unwell. Um, the first item of business is an evidence session on the Children and Young People Information Sharing Scotland Bill. This is the third meeting where we will be considering the bill. We have already heard from the Scottish Government's bill team and members of the legal profession and the health service. This morning, the panel's focus is on services local authorities provide, including in relation to education and social work. And this morning, I welcome to the meeting Dr Gary Clapton, Senior Lecturer, Social Work School of Social and Political Science, University of Edinburgh, Andrew Keir, Gerfeck Manager, North Ayrshire Health and Social Care Partnership, Jackie Nichols, Team Leader, Social Work Services, Glasgow City Health and Social Care Partnership, and Jenny Brown, Principal Teacher of Pupil Support from Fries and Galloway Council Education Services. I should say to the panel from the outset that if you'd like to respond to a question, please indicate to me or the clerks and I will call you to speak. Thank you very much. And uh, I would ask Ross to open up the questioning. Thanks, Convener. Um, it would be useful to know, just to begin with, what the current state of play is with the implementation of GERFEC and named person in your local authorities. Um, the GERFEC is interwoven in all our policies and procedures at the moment. The named person hasn't um, been uh, implemented in any meaningful way. Last year, there was a kind of proof of concept, proof of concept a hub started, but that was sort of abandoned in the light of the Supreme Court ruling. So we, we don't really have, as a Glasgow employee, and particularly as a social work employee in Glasgow, we don't have a lot of experience of the named person and its potential impact on service delivery. Uh, in North Ayrshire, we, getting right for every child has been around since uh, 2005, I think, was the first document that we talked about, getting it right for every child. Um, in North Ayrshire, we have used the terms name person, but of course, the, the Act spells out the specific functions. So we haven't taken those functions forward. Um, and it really has only been a name only. Up until, I think, last year, we have developed a name person service, uh, a physical service located in our, our headquarters. Now, this only function at the moment because... <clears throat> We initially thought it would be a good vehicle to support named persons, to share concerns with other professionals. However, we put a stop to that um, because we're unclear about the information sharing uh, and, and we re didn't revert back. We always kept the Data Protection Act and shared information with consent. Their function at the moment, the sole function, is to manage requests for assistance. So if a family uh, requests assistance that to the named person, it will come to the hub who will either route it to that particular service or try and find a service to support that child. It's in a consent-based model only. So we're not sharing information. It's only about family saying, I need this sort of help. Um, in Dumfries and Galloway, I would say, um, certainly in terms of education, I think we're quite far down the road in uh, GERFEC terms and uh, certainly been using um, the idea behind the name person in education probably for the last three years um, and to some extent have been sharing information um, and probably a little like Ayrshire, um, there were plans to set up a hub where information would come in and then route out into different agencies. That was put on hold obviously when the Act um, didn't go through. Um, but in terms of education, um, that is how um, we run our policy and we look after our pupils within uh, Dumfries and Galloway. Um, although we don't have that backup of, of the Act actually being implemented yet, but we do, um, everything goes through the name person in terms of the pupil in the school and information is being shared to some extent from other agencies. <clears throat> we worry a little bit when we talk about implementation of GERFEC. GERFEC for me is not a thing. It's a set of values, it's a set of principles, it's a way of working, it's a, a, a new culture, practices, systems. Um, and, and I think we've all been trying to do that um, 
especially focusing on culture. We, we made the mistake where we, we can um, construct some systems, but if we don't actually change the culture. So we've, we've tried to really enforce those values and principles going back to the beginning of what getting it right is all about um, and not worrying too much about the system around that at the moment. Thanks. Sorry, Dr. Clark. Oh, sorry, Dr. Clark. I can speak for my students, uh, so it's kind of second hand, and it's their experiences in the local authorities around this area where we have placements. And I would agree um, with what Andrew just said, in that um, whilst getting it right for every child, Girthek is very much part of what I hear about their placement experiences. Um, the named person uh, today isn't. Okay. Thanks. I was going to ask, has the, the debate over the last year, the, the uncertainty around this, has that affected current practice in terms of infor sharing information that falls below the child protection threshold? Uh, I would say in Glasgow it did. The pilot of the hub scheme did cause a bit of confusion. Information was getting sent direct to the hub and in some cases the, the children had an allocated social worker but they weren't getting informed about the incident that had occurred. Um, in addition, there was, I think, a more uh, defensive practice in terms of the information that was being provided. An example was the police sharing a notice of concern, rightly so, a children had been um, removed to family over a weekend because of an incident in the family home, but they wouldn't provide social work with the grandmother's phone number. Now, it, it, it was a need-to-know basis, was their view. They told us about the incident, and we obviously had the address and we could go. It was very... It was, I think it was probably an overzealous um, implementation of the need-to-know aspect of the uh, information sharing. But that's just one example. There were, there were similar, um, where there was a kind of reticence to share information that previously would have been helpful and certainly would have... Um, aided, you know, just checking on the welfare of the children? I, I think, um, in author's experience, I, I think we've wasted a lot of time, valuable time. Um, w when we're looking at implementing an act and, and statutory guidance, um, we obviously don't wait to the, the last in the, the midnight hour to, to train our staff, to produce materials, to have people ready for that implementation. So we had a long... Um, possibly a year um, before the first act or was to be implemented by producing materials based on what was in the act, um, materials based on what was written about the information sharing at that time. We trained all our named persons. And, and I guess now we have to go and unpick all that and go back and, and say, no, actually, status quo is where we were um, in terms of information sharing the Data Protection Act. So I think that for us there's been a lot of quite wasted time. I'm sure it wasn't done deliberately by anybody. <laughs> I'm um, sure it wasn't. I, I would maybe say um, I was seconded to be a GERFEC support officer from education last year and uh, some of our role involved training staff um, but also taking phone calls in an advisory capacity um, and most of those phone calls were about <coughs> whether they should share or not. And it was at that level, just below child protection. And staff, of it, I think, felt very vulnerable and were very wary of sharing in those circumstances where perhaps before that they were maybe more willing to share. Um, and I think there was concern about being personally liable um, I don't know how much you know about the CMIS um, wellbeing software programme. Uh, CMIS is the software that we use in education to record pastoral notes, but also form chronologies on pupils. And as part of that new software programme, which I believe is, um, it has been rolled out across the whole of Scotland, um, built into that was making sure that um, consent was um, was a topic that you had discussed when you got to an assessment of a child um, and staff expressed concern when we were going through that training that they were going to be held personally liable because we had to state 
whether we had consent or not, and what the views of the parent, child were, etc., and data, etc. And there was a lot of concern when we were doing training there about that. Thanks, and just br uh, briefly, Commissioner, how much will the duty to consider, how much does that represent a change from current practice in your authorities? I, from a social work perspective, I don't think it represents much of a change at all. Um, that, that is our uh, day and daily um, taking in information and processing it, deciding what is appropriate to share and who it to be shared with. Um, you know, we, we may inform education of an incident that we believe may have caused a child trauma, but withhold details that the police have maybe provided us with uh, more details that, that people don't need to have that kind of in-depth detail. So I don't, I don't see that as a shift at all. Okay. I think I'll just reiterate that in terms of, of uh, I work across a partnership, so um, social work, health uh, and, and education. And I think, it, I think practitioners have always considered what information may be relevant to share. Where I do think it might have an impact is adult services, where um, a family addiction <coughs> service or mental health have a dependent child and, and helping adult services to think about the impact in that child so, and then what they do with that. So that, that may be an advantage to the duty to consider on our adult services, but on named persons, and, and principal lead professionals come from social work, I think that's already part of their psyche. Dr. Clark. Okay, the, the, one of the main principles we teach in social work, that partnership with parents is actually um, the nip plus ultra of a good social work practice. And one of the concerns that was been around and, and still hangs in the air about the scheme is that it's, um, um, it was about parents rather than for parents. And that's a, 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 you know, a, a phrase that's hung around a lot. And many of the social work students that I work with um, have come back and talked about that. And, and it comes up against, it, 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 it butts up against basic social work values about partnership. So the duty to consider is one that's actually you know, well part of what we do, uh, part of our psyche, as you said. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, I would say in education as well that um, I think staff do consider very carefully um, whether they're sharing or not, and I think that has always been the case. Thank you. Joanne, do you want to I just wondered if there was a difference in that um, there's a duty to consider in, in law, there would be an expectation of evidence of you having considered. I mean, presumably, professionally, it's something you do, but you wouldn't necessarily have to record it in the way it's been asked now, or is there no difference? Hmm. I, I, I think the difficulty is that. <laughs> Practitioners are considering all the time. Information is coming to them all the time. And, and then, what, what then, or when do you record something that you have either decided to share or not decided to share? Mm -hmm. And I think that becomes a bureaucratic um, nightmare and, and resource intensive when you have to think about every time, should I share this? No, I better record why I haven't mm -hmm. shared it. I don't know where the threshold is for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that'd be very difficult. Does anybody else have any? You not? Okay. In that case, Liz. I wonder if I could come uh, to ask you for some comments on uh, previous evidence that we've taken. Uh, we were told uh, three weeks ago by the Bill team uh, that the concept of well-being uh, was well utilised and well understood. And then last week we heard from uh, both the legal uh, profession and also from uh, other witnesses who were representing the Royal College of Nursing, various other professionals, saying that they did not agree with that. Could I ask for your perspective on it? Sorry. Um, from a practitioner's point of view, I think um, when I had studied the 2014 Act, I know that the, the uh, legal services had been critical of the shift away from welfare, which was a kind of, in legal terms, easily defined. And I know in legal terms, um, well-being remains a bit of an uh, unknown. However, I would say, from a practitioner's point of view, we are quite clear that well, the, the, the holistic um, needs of a child that, that would incorporate into well-being. And you know, it's not necessarily child protection. I think there is a, more of an understanding at a frontline practitioner's view maybe than can then be 
taken into the legal system. Uh, can I just come back on that? It's a very interesting mm -hmm. point you've mm -hmm. just uh, raised. And given uh, the answers that you gave to uh, Ross Greer, do, do you feel that there is actually a need for the name person policy, given that the implication is that uh, you're highly professional in the way that you're approaching things already in terms yeah. of GERFIC and working through the system? Do we actually need a name person policy at all? Well, I'm very aware that as a social work uh, representative, I'm only dealing with a relatively small number, although it doesn't always feel like that, um, of, the, of Scotland's children. So, um, you know, when I'm speaking about my involvement, it is that small group of children that come into the uh, social work arena. I think the principle around the named person is... Uh, I don't think anybody could argue with the principle of it. Um, our understanding of adverse childhood experiences, the impact of trauma on children, and the presence of one consistent person in ameliorating these, um, the impact, the negative impact of this is, you know, well documented. My, I suppose my worry is that while it's an additional task to a teacher or a health visitor it's perhaps not um, as meaningful as, you know, if, if, if we're serious about it, can the named person be, that's their job. They have a group of children that they are the named person for, yes. and that's what they do. Yeah. Can, I, can I just pick up on that too? Because I think you know, everybody's agreed that the, the most important focus here is our most vulnerable children. Yes. And that's come across loud and clear in all evidence, mm -hmm. irrespective of people's views, whether they're for or against the named person. Um, what, what I'm interested in, though, is that if you feel that the professional standards that are used by practitioners yes. are working well enough without the actual named person element of GERFEG, uh -huh. then that obviously questions whether it's right to have this new bill and to have a different uh, code of practice. So, uh, I'm just interested in your views as practitioners who know far more about mm -hmm. this on the front line mm -hmm. than we do. I actually had a, a presentation to a group of practitioners around the named person, and I think they would, to an individual, say that, <laughs> yes, they can see the merit in the named person, but not for their child. And I think that's the bottom line. People will be... Um, oh, yes, I can see it being very useful for, but not my child, not my grandchild. We don't need that. You know, we, we don't need a named person. And why do you think they're saying that? Because they, they believe as parents they are, um, or as grandparents, they are uh, amongst a group of adults who uh, hold the well-being of that particular child as the priority. Unfortunately, we know that that isn't the case for every child in Scotland. And we also know that um, it isn't the case for... It, it's not the case that every child who isn't having that positive experience is known to social work. Mm. Um, so that would be where the named person would be um, useful in, in the vulnerable child that maybe isn't being identified um, as quickly. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, OK. Uh, right, we'll move on then to Gillian. Yeah, pick up on that. From a, from a child's perspective... The, just picking up what you're saying, we were looking at it from the parent's perspective there, but from a child's perspective, the name person's providing a single point of contact that they might otherwise have difficulty in knowing who to go to to unlock a whole lot of services. I mean, that's a major part of the name person. Do you see that being affected at all by, by what, what's been proposed in, in the, the change here? Or in terms of information yes. sharing? I suppose it's a... a it's a little more difficult for me to comment on the named person. I tend, when I'm speaking, I'm, I'm speaking as a social work practitioner and um, you know, with limited experience of the roles and responsibilities around the named person. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what the it's, parameters yeah, of that role Maybe a better be. question for yes. Jenny Brown, given that you will, you'll, you will be a named person, no, no doubt. Um, Sorry, can you just repeat uh, yeah, what so, your original So we have been was. talking about this largely so far about, about the impact that, that this has on uh, parents and those that are becoming named person, mm -hmm. but the whole obviously ethos of the named person is a child having a single point mm -hmm. of contact. And I think possibly, we were talking about this earlier, I think possibly in education they had that anyway mm -hmm. with a principal teacher of pupil support. And I think 
the, the principles that are um, aligned with GERFEC are all good ones, you know, about you know, looking at the child holistically, early intervention, all of that. And I think a, a good pupil support teacher probably did that anyway and was a good point of contact. And education currently is um, trying to emphasise nurturing principles, etc. Mm -hmm. And they all sort of work together there. I, f I think it probably would work, and, and I think it did work, without the, the name person role being there. But now, now um, I, I suppose my question is, in front of us, I'm asking you what you want now to happen with regards to, for example, the code of practice around mm -hmm. clarity. What, what, what do you, this is your opportunity to effectively mm -hmm. feed in mm -hmm. to a, a forum mm -hmm. about what you want out of the, the code of practice as practitioners. What I would want is something that is very straightforward, that is um, backing up professional judgment, which I think most of the time is very sound and is based on uh, you know, putting the, the child at the centre and doing the best for the child. Um, so it's really to back up the decisions that are, I suppose, currently being made and make sure that a teacher isn't exposed to legal retribution mm -hmm. in whatever way. But it has to be done in a very straightforward manner. Um, teachers are extremely busy at the moment. There's a constantly changing environment <laughs> in terms of exams, etc. Um, this is an additional workload. Um, and if you bear in mind secondary school teachers in mm. particular, you know, exams are really... Mm. But if, you're, if you, just, you just said to me that you're effectively doing what the name person is already, I, how mm. do you see it being an additional workload if you're already doing it? What, do you, what aspect of this do you well, see Well, I, as being I suppose the, the, the planning process that the name person added, the child's planning process was additional, but the idea of having a individual who a child could approach and who had an overview on everything that was happening in their life, I think that's pretty much always been the case. Mm -hmm. Can I ask it from the social work point of view, um, who obviously engage with schools, um, what you want to see from the Code of Practice? Personally, I don't particularly think the Code of Practice needs to be in legislation. I think it needs to be robust and um, I suppose I had looked at the draft um, code of practice and certainly it just it felt a bit the perennial issue around for services about information sharing and you know the, the, the last item of if it's in the best interest of the child so it comes back again to professional judgment um, and I think we were discussing that and I think as the document says, the, the, it's the responsibility of the local authority who, not the named person as an individual. And I think if, named, if the named person is aware of that and is given guidance about what information they can share and ultimately they're not going to be personally liable um, if they share information or indeed don't share mm -hmm. information. And presumably, yeah. I think, yeah. The, I, I think to the question about named person policy, I think the concept of having a named person, someone to coordinate at lower level is actually a fantastic idea and it's what we, we need, someone to coordinate support, the children that need support. The difficulty comes from the question was asked about well-being is how we interpret well-being. You know, from one practitioner to another, dependent on their personal experience and professional experience, I may have a very different view of what it means to be respected or responsible or, or, or anything else. So I think well-being has its difficulties in terms of interpretation and thresholds. However, from the code of practice, I, I like my colleague, don't think that we uh, need to have that code of practice linked to legislation. We seem to have forgotten about the practice that's around getting ready for every child. There's a practice model. There's a five practitioner questions. Um, what's getting away with this child's well-being? What information do I need? What can I do? What can my agency do? What help do I need from others? And I think we need to attach the guidance, robust guidance with examples of, of what that might look in practice, 
linked to getting it right for every child. We seem to have disassociated um, ourselves from getting it right for every child and going through a, a very much a legal route. And I'd like to see the both of them coming back to having robust practice document around the already established national practice model questions and processes. Then it becomes real to practitioners. They know when and at what points they need to share and not have a, a, a legislative document, which, to be honest, if I'm in a field and I'm busy and somebody says, Andrew, does that comply with Schedule 2? Oh, OK. I haven't got time. I need something very quick that I can make sense of. The Dr Clapton wanted to come in. Thanks. Um, I think the benign element of the named person scheme seems to have been lost in the midst of time with all the, um, um, the, the, the discussions and debates that have taken place over the last couple of years. And it strikes me is that um, one of the challenges is to articulate what's the added value that this, uh, this scheme brings to the table uh, of existing um, services, um, head teacher, um, health visitor. And I think there is a, 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 a problem with, uh, as Andrew said, the um, lack of, um, we missed an opportunity to, um, to articulate anything more than the um, um, well-being um, still remains undefined. And there are a number of uh, indicators, um, there are H and R indicators, but there are a number of nearly 269 sub-indicators and they, they've kind of grown arms and legs, the d definitions, some of them, some of them very technical, um, laughs a lot. Um, and I, it's one of the main concerns in my written submission that this increasing thicket of indicators would be one of those things that um, would either lower the threshold of uh, intervention and thus, um, uh, you know, that there's the issue of um, mistrust um, might develop. Um, and, and, but it plays alongside of existing child protection uh, procedures that we have already, which are, um, uh, they are, they have their difficulties, but they are fairly well articulated in terms of the children's hearing systems, uh, definitions of abuse, and so on. Um, but when you start to move well-being onto the table as well, uh, things become messy and conflated. And I, I believe that's a major challenge for, for, for us. Okay. Hey. Oliver, you said you wanted to come in, but very briefly, because Ruth's, Ruth's just about to come in. Just on the point, really, from Andrew around the code of practice and some of the other things that we mentioned, and you're saying, you know, you don't think a code of practice should be in legislation. I mean, the problem is the Supreme Court have sort of asked for, you know, some of these things to be legislated on so that they're clear in law. And I just don't see how it's possible to match up what you need as professionals and what people need in terms of legal certainty in any form of, you know, it's sort of difficult to see how you'd, you know, the yeah. Scottish Government says it's difficult to put that in primary legislation because that requires to be very precise and specific and to cover, you know, all these different possibilities. Do you think I, it's just... I, I, I just don't see what the bill gives us in addition to what we've already got in terms of the Data Protection Act, Human Rights Act. I, I don't see, apart from the duty to consider, <coughs> I, I don't actually see what else it gives us. And why would you legislate when you already have existing legislation in place? And all you're saying is refer to this legislation. I, 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 but that's an argument for uh, legal services in terms of practitioners. This is something very simple that we need that tells us. And it can't be prescriptive because it can't be prescriptive because every single situation will be different. People's lives are different, and that goes back to the point of well-being. We, when we, um, we compartmentalise ourselves into these indicators, we lose that kind of subjective well-being. And, and we can look at subjective well-being in two elements of personal well-being. So how a child feels about themselves, what's their resilience, their identity, their belonging, all those things that Shanari doesn't really give us. And also that social well-being. What's their community like? Have they trusted adults? What's their relationships? Again, I don't think it gives us that. Um, so I, I think when we're considering to share, practitioners just don't look at well-being in that very narrow um, scenario. They look at other things that impact on that and, and make those decisions whether to share or not. 
legislation. I think, yes, with legislation, but as long as it doesn't confuse practice, and I think it's what it's doing now. Practitioners are retreating back to, I better not share everything, anything, because I really don't know where I'm supposed to go to get my advice from, or get my, my legal advice from. So I, I think sorry. that from practitioner, message sorry. is clear. Okay. You can come back in yeah, later on. Draw um, folks' attention to the Register of Interests. I'm a former North Ayrshire councillor. Yeah. <laughs> um, good morning, panel. Thanks for being here. Um, we've taken quite a bit of evidence around the, the code of practice, and I know colleagues have, have touched on it. I think um, what I hear that it needs to be clear and accessible, and in language that, that all the practitioners who are involved with uh, children and families can, can use meaningfully. What extent um, are your views on the bill dependent on the content of the finalised code of practice? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. I would. I would think um, absolutely. You know. The, 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 what we will think of the bill is absolutely hinged on the final um, code of practice that is drawn up. It's, um, it's useful to debate that, but yes, the actual finished article would, could sway the view of the bill in its entirety. I think as it stands, it's an illustrative draft, so I don't think we can put much, but I think... Um, if it's overly legalistic, I, I think it will have no impact on practitioners whatsoever. It, 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 the code of practice needs to have some meaningful triggers in there that practitioners can say, yep, I know, I know not quite what, I know what decisions or questions I need to ask to be able to take this next step further. There are other material out there from the ICO and others that have got examples that work you through when and when or what things you should consider in quite accessible language. So I think code of practice is, um, I think my plea would just be in a language that practitioners find it easy to navigate and not overly legalistic because I think for, it, well, again, it comes back to who's a code of practice for? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I'm not quite sure who it is for. Is it just for named persons? It's for all practitioners that come into contact with children? I, I'm, I'm unsure. So that changes the shape of the, the code of practice, depending who the audience is. Um, I would say, um, if information sharing is at the heart of this whole act and about named persons working to advantage, then this code of practice is right behind that. It has to be something that's accessible, that's easy, that's quick. Because if it's to help name persons if it's to support their decisions, then it has to be something that is straightforward, quick, flowchart type information. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, staff will not, they'll not use it, they won't have the time to use it. It has to be something that's very accessible. And just following on from that, what um, involvement would you expect your organisations to have in forming a code of practice and what involvement have you had previously these types of things I, I would expect that each health service partnership local authority be consulted but more than just consulted I think um, uh, the legislators need to learn from practice experience and it would be good to have a representation from you know practitioners at some point in that journey, rather than just a consultation and draft at the end. Okay. I think one thing that's come out of the, the evidence sessions is that the, the government will clearly be having to listen to the stakeholders about the code yeah. of practice. I mean, that, I think that's perfectly clear. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, did you want to come back in here, Oliver? Of questions and a bit more probably following on, on from that. On that, that's okay. Right, okay, well, on I'll you try not to take call. up too much time. Um, I just, I, I just wonder really, you know, when you're talking about flowcharts and making it easy to understand, I mean, the really, I mean, these are really difficult, complex legal questions, and that's why obviously the previous legislation went all the way to the Supreme Court. 
you know, and was weighed up at length and balancing various different cases, you know, and, and uh, you know, that have happened in the past and looking, you know, at a whole range of different bits of legislation and how they interact. I mean, I, I just wonder, I mean, do you think that can ever be explained in a flowchart? Do you think that practitioners you know, and people on the ground are ever going to understand the intricacies and the, you know, around proportionality and, you know, how all those different bits of legislation fit in? Do you think it's do you think it's possible to, simplif to simplify that and still meet the still meet the sort of legislative standard? Okay. I think the only way to <laughs> it's very difficult to simplify and very complex and, and not only is it complex in terms of the, the law and the requirements and what you have to consider because there's lots of ambiguous terms. The best, you know, public interest. What what does that mean? Um, um, it, so there are interpretations that practitioners have to put on, whatever terminology we use. It talks about in the, the bill, in the opinion of, well, we all have different opinions. So I don't even think the bill of that is going to make it any clearer for us on, on the kind of decisions to make it easier. What will make it easier is through training, but having a consistent message of when we need to ask certain questions. Um, and if we can do that, and again, I, I come back to well-being. We, we, we interpret well-being in lots of different ways. So people's thresholds will be different. And that's why I think we really need to build in a kind of model where practitioners can go and ask somewhere. Now, we want them to go and ask their managers. Um, they can come and ask the name person service. There's, there's no reason why any professional can't pick up a phone to another one and anonymise and say, of this child here, here's the situation, what do you think we should do about it, without actually disclosing any information about that child. So I think we need to build in some of those safeguards that practitioners can actually get assistance and help to think through. Um, but it is a complex area, and, and people have different thresholds, and that's the difficulty. Uh, what su suggests that there's not going to be those safeguards in place just now? You know, like I said, mm -hmm. uh, this, is, this is how you would work just now, I, su I suspect, right, that you would phone a colleague, anonymise a situation. Yep. Why would anybody think that, oh, that that's not what will happen? Well, it, it is, that's interesting. It is what happens, so why do we need an act but you, you, if it's already happening? Well, well we need the Name Persons Act, but the, what we're, we're here mm -hmm. about is this specific Supreme Court decision and, and having to mm -hmm. address that. So, I mean, that, that's exactly what this session is about. Yeah. So, I mean, we're here because the Supreme Court told us to be here. But for me, I, yeah, to, for me to take that forward, I need to be clear what the legislative landscape is like. Now, I'm not unsure. I'm unsure what that's not like. Or I am sure what it's like at the moment, but I don't know what it's going to be like. We have to future plan, train our staff. It doesn't happen overnight. We have to prepare for that. We need to know. Now, we already have those things in place. My question is, will they still be in place? If the answer is yes, then why are we changing anything? Because we have a Data Protection Act. We have processes. We have things in place already. So I don't understand why we need a new bill to actually tell us what we should, what we're to do in the future if we're doing it already. Oh. Um, thank, thank you, convener. I, I just want to say, and it wasn't a point, I just wondered in the government's own policy memorandum, I think they do say there are options possible for the Named Persons Act to continue without this legislation at all. But uh, my final question is just around, you, you said, I think before, you wanted, I think, more than consultation mm -hmm. and wanted involvement in it. Do you... As practitioners, people working in this field, do you find it odd or unusual that members of the Scottish Parliament won't have a vote or have a formal sort of say on the final code of practice? You know, that it won't be, there's no necessity for it to be gone through in detail, you know, by members of this committee, for example. Do you find that unusual or would you, would you expect, given its importance to the legislation, that members of Parliament would have? You know, it would have more of a direct say over whether or not the code was signed off. I think we should. Right. <laughs> but I'm not a practitioner, so you yeah. address that to the yeah. practitioner. I wasn't aware that they wouldn't have a final overview and say on signing off. And no, I think um, it would probably be... The code of practices are, uh, not, are normally drafted up after the bill. I mean, this is a very unusual 
uh, situation where we get an illustrative code of practice which was given to us to be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be interesting to see if we get one the next time as a bill. But, uh, okay, Oliver, are you finished? Yeah, I've finished. Thank, right, you. thank you very much. Uh, Colin. Thank you, Mira. Um, Jenny Brown mentioned some concerns about consent, and I'd like to explore a little bit more around that. And the first thing is the, the degree to which yourselves are aware of the changes to the GDPR and what implications this might have for your practice around seeking consent for information sharing. Uh, yeah, yeah, and minus too, I'm afraid. Yeah. The only knowledge is that it will strengthen um, the seeking of consent and, and the rights of children and, and, and adults. I, I think consent is always a, <laughs> a difficult... I, I think we should always be asking for consent, unless, of course, it places that child at additional risk, with criminal proceedings, etc., etc., it's always good practice to work in, in alongside families and, and work in partnership. And I don't know if we can ever achieve full partnership with families because we're in a different kind of um, power differential because of the nature of what we do. Um, but I think Hedy Cleaver back in 2001, I think, in Message from Research for Child Protection, talked about how practitioners through honesty, integrity, um, etc., can build that partnership and that trust. And I think once you have that trust with families, it's a lot easier to discuss. Consent always becomes part of the conversation rather than something we kind of spring on people because it's about getting support and help. So I think we, we should always be asking for consent as a first port of call, and I think the GDPR will strengthen that. Um, the issue comes about how you record that and where you record it, and if consent's refused, what you do with it then. But I think the Data Protection Act actually covers all that in terms of the risk of significant harm or potential risk, the, the um, public interest. So I, I do know that it will strengthen consent, and I think consent rightly, um, in terms of people's rights to be able to uh, participate as, as, as appropriately there. I was particularly struck by the Information Commissioner uh, talking about GDPR and saying that a public authority won't be able to rely on consent as a legal basis for processing in any case where there's a clear imbalance between it and the individual to whom the data relates. Is that actually significantly different from where we are at the moment? I <laughs> think it's a hard question. <laughs> I'll go on to an easier one. <laughs> um, within the context of the name person service, how best can you ensure that the consent, the consent is explicit, freely given, and easy to withdraw after it's given? Is that an easy? No, that's not any easier. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I could uh, yeah. I mean when you have a relationship and you have built up um, a knowledge of the child and the parents then it's obviously always easier in those circumstances um, but that isn't always the case um, I mean do you always get written consent or is um, verbal satisfactory we're probably moving more to written consent now and consent to share and naming who it, it will be shared with. Um, yeah, we are moving more to that in, in schools, certainly. Yeah. We've got the Information Commissioner next week, Colin, which... Sorry? We've got the Information Commissioner next week, so these are questions of probably... Certainly follow up on that, on, on the, that mm -hmm. particular point. Um, do you think that uh, the bill itself should refer to consent, or is it enough that it's in, a, in the code of practice, which of course is going to be a mandatory code of practice? Does it make any difference? Right, okay, <laughs> I, I guess, thank you. I, I, guess I, I just didn't want to speak too much. <laughs> um, I, I, I guess what 
it depends what the bill says about consent. Or whether it should be the bill or not. Consent is, consent is if you look at the uh, consent, you should only be consenting for particular information for a particular purpose. That, that's re really hard in practice. It's really hard because um, your intervention with the family is often multifaceted. You're having different information at different times. You might use it differently. So that's really kind of difficult to record every time you have a new piece of information that you want to share that's not for a particular, might be for a different purpose. However, it is important that we get that. How you record that um, how you make sense of that in the bill. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, I'll, gi I'll give you an easy one as, as, as a last question. Um, should the bill include a requirement to consider the views of the child, young person or parent when considering whether to share the information? In other words, should it be part of the legislation? I guess the purpose of legislation is to um, enable a consistency. Um, and I, I know that probably 99% of practitioners would involve the views of the child, they would ask the child about it, depending on the circumstance of that child, the age of that child, etc. And I suppose you'll always get some practitioner who, who maybe not do that. So to have a blanket, I think I actually think the code of practice is where it should sit and not in the legislation. I think the code of practice, if it's robust and it's clear enough, then I think that's sufficient to have consent and um, the views of the child articulated there. Okay. Uh, Claire. Thank you, convener. Can I just pick up a little bit on, on what, particularly what Jackie and Jenny were talking about earlier on, um, in terms of current practice for for information sharing so can you tell me how, how you would currently operate if you had information about a child that you had concerns about from my perspective um as a keep reiterating it's it's not a named person it's a social Absolutely. work um frontline practitioner and manager um we would as i had previously said we would routinely my role that I'm referring to was the intake team, so this is referrals from members of the public, other agencies who about children who are not allocated, they don't have a worker. So, you know, there's a myriad of different situations that we get um, referrals about. For instance, uh, domestic abuse referrals from the police, just because it's one of the most, you know, we get um, a lot. Um, we would aim to inform the universal services. As I said, that there had been an incident that children were witness or nearby, we would use our uh, discretion as to how much of the information about the detail was given. In terms, so did, did you want me to comment on getting consent to? Well, it is about consent and yeah. what's. Yeah, what I mean, I, I, I mean, I, we would always aim to speak to the victim of the. Um, if, it, if it's domestic abuse we're talking about, and in that we'd be saying that we're going to speak to the agencies that are the universal agencies that are involved in the child's life, because depending on the nature of the incident, social work could hold that information and never actually see that child, whereas a teacher's seeing five days a week, um, and it may impact on how they can support that child in the future. Um, I would seek consent of the parent advisor, if she had, sometimes families will um, describe very personal reasons. The secretary is a, a neighbor and they, they, they won't want schools informed. You, you use your discretion again, perhaps speaking just to the head teacher, not discussing even names with anybody else. But um, I would say as um, using professional judgment all the time, as to how much information is protecting the children without sort of infringing on people's right to a private life. So, so currently you're already doing Yes. That. You're already using professional judgment. You're already deciding on this is information mm -hmm. that I should share or information that, that actually I shouldn't share without consent. Mm -hmm. and, and initially, the first thing that you would do is you would approach someone and, and ask for consent. 
the, the, normally the first thing we'd be doing is um, checking that the family are okay so part of that would be and th this is you know we're, we're, we will discuss with the school um, that's not always possible sometimes it, you know we can't make contact with the family for whatever reason so it may well be that the um, other agencies would be approached mm -hmm. before we have um, gained consent um, I was going to say that um, the difficulty that is, is always the level below child protection um, and I what we do. I think child protection is quite clear. Yes, we all absolutely. Have a in, in a way, it is in school and it's that's absolutely fine. If it's below child protection um, and you don't have consent or you have tried to gain consent um, and that has been refused, um, in my experience, you would probably go to an advisor of some description. We've got a child protection officer, and you would probably do it in an anonymous fashion um, and ask for advice. Um, and it's hard to say without going into absolute details of situations where sometimes it has then not been shared, nothing has, has been done, or in other situations that it has because you're, you're going into um, you know, the minute detail of why one was okay and why one wasn't. But I think in those circumstances, most named persons would be going to an advisor, they would be anonymising and they would be asking, what do you think? And it normally is social work that we're probably talking about that um, we probably want to, to share it with. So with regard to that then, so you're, you, you, you've then gone into the, the realms of, of us having named persons, which wasn't what I was talking about, I was mm -hmm. talking about current practice. So, mm -hmm. so have local authorities looked at ways of supporting staff within social work, within education, in terms of providing them with some of these these places to go, some information, what's, what's the mm -hmm. development? I mean, although... You know, name person isn't a, isn't in statute. We have been using it in our area um, as sort of, you know, that's how we operationalise our, our business, if you like. Um, sorry, I've, I've forgotten and the well, question now. I, uh, well, I was asking about um, what has been put in place in uh -huh. terms of, or what mm -hmm. local authorities intend to put in place. But um, now that you're saying that you're actually you are sort of operating maybe a mm -hmm. shadow. Yes. Shadow yes. name person. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. what do you have currently in place for your for mm -hmm. your staff in terms of seeking some of that support and guidance? Yeah. So, there. I mean, you you normally work in a team uh, within a school anyway. So, it would be working and talking about um, information that you have within the team. It would be going to normally at regional level. There is an advisor who you can speak to. Um, normally, there are educational psychologists who would um, probably on a monthly basis visit the school and again in an anonymous situation you would bring up pupils that are causing concern so yeah and has that been working well in that shadow system in terms of supporting staff yes that? yes so far mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and jackie sorry sorry can if you'll indulge me um if I could ask you about what supports you think that the local authorities have put in place or have been looking at put in place for um, particularly, I suppose, child and family social workers? Uh -huh. Well, there's obviously the line management structure. So a worker, if they were in any doubt about you know, information sharing, they would be speaking to their line manager. You know, we do have requests, for instance, from solicitors for information, and we would seek advice from um, our legal section and also, you know, the, the uh, data protection mm -hmm. um, advisors within the local authority. In terms of... <coughs> the sort of education phoning us about, you know, what, what do you think about this piece of information? We do have in the locality, you obviously, um, you, you have relationships with head teachers in the local schools in your area. So, that, you know, it is quite possible you would get a phone call just, but that's not a formal structure. That's much more informal, just, um, you know, you've, you've um, met at different venues and so they would seek a bit of, uh, guidance and that and also all the formal structure of social care direct and, and can I just confirm though for, for the record that for both of you step one with any information would be 
in, in normal circumstances out with child protection, immediate child protection concerns, would be to seek permission to share that information. It wouldn't be something you would be immediately looking to share that information without seeking permission from child of their appropriate age or parent or caregiver. Well, I suppose it would depend on, you know, there's a myriad of different pieces of information. For example, Jenny may phone to say, look, this is the umpteenth time this child has come in grubby, smelly. It's not necessarily child protection, maybe a family needing a wee bit extra support, mums. Uh, we, we don't know them, I think that's the crux of the matter. Um, that they're not a family that we, we're familiar with necessarily. So it might be that we would contact the health visitor immediately and just say, you know, you've been in the family home. What is your experience? Is, is this unusual? Do we, does social work need to be involved or could the health visitor offer the family a wee bit of support? So I wouldn't say that we, that, no, that the first thing we would do is phone the mother and say the schools express concerns, we're going to phone the health visitor. So if, you would if that's what you share meant. that information? You mm -hmm. would already share that information? Yes, I would probably seek information back. I suppose it's just investigating and assessing at that stage. Um, but, you know, it might, it does mean sharing the information that the school have contacted us with that concern. I've, yeah, I've already mentioned um, my concern about the conflation of um, child protection with wellbeing. And um, it's kind of connected. The other concern is... Uh, what is it? It's, will the promulgation and formalisation of well-being indicators trigger unneeded and unwanted attention? Is uh, a huge question. I mean, and the kind of like the corollary of that is, uh, will it increase uh, kind of mistrust? Um, we already got um, systems where information is shared informally, and um, the um, if we if we legislate um, and formalise um, um, some of this material. The concern would be that um, there would be you know, overly formal um, processes in place, and um, as I say, based on what I've challenged, is uh, a kind of quite disparate uh, set of well-being indicators. So that's a concern of mine. But are we not already using those well-being indicators? No. But quite widely, and obviously, education and health and social work, we're using that as a common language to speak about children and, the, and their development. You know, the <laughs> uh, it depends what you mean by well-being. Well, I'm talking about the GERFIC principles. Yeah. We're already using those right across a child's development. Right. Yeah. Mr Keir, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I, 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 well, I can remember the original question now, but I, I was <laughs> going to say <laughs> that um, about, about getting support for children. We, we've done something in an early years that I'll just give an example, and we're looking to extend it. We, we have placed... And I think Health and Social Care Partnership helps us do this. We've placed social workers in a health visiting team. So we've got a team of health visitors with a social worker who's managed by a health visiting manager. So in all terms, purpose, they're part of that team. We've taken child protection away from them. We've taken looked after children away from them. So they're purely there to support and assist families. So the health visitor will always ask and identify with the family what issues it might be. It might be for relationships. It might be a whole myriad of, myriad of things. But the health officer will always ask, I've got social work here who haven't got that, can they come and support you? And the answer, nine times out of ten, has been yes. Mm -hmm. GERFEC is about getting the right help at the right time to the right person. And again, as I said at the very beginning, let's not forget getting it right for every child. And, and it's about how do we pass, and it's not about a, a teacher becoming a, a, a social work assessor, it's not becoming but it's about using different people's skills. And to do that, you have to share information to utilize someone. So social work have got great skills around assessment, building therapeutic relationships. So what we do is with consent, we involve them in a very early. Uh, so it's a new model of doing things and we're looking to extend that towards our five to 18. Can we do that within schools? Can we get that support right at the very point so it becomes preventative, it becomes early intervention but it takes the stigma of social work intervention away. It's just using the right skills, the right people, but you have to share information to do that. Joanne? Yeah, um, just really briefly reflecting on everything that you've, you've said today, um, if I were being the devil's advocate, I would say 
that one of the reasons some of our young people were failed because of professional misjudgments and not speaking to each other, and that has been the driver for this legislation. Um, and I wonder, some of the, the evidence we've had has suggested, and I think uh, you, Dr Clayton, in, in particular have suggested that if we formalise this, you lose the, the intuitive the instinct for understanding there's a problem and that there will be defensive practice. To what extent do you think that is a problem? Because in, in, in essence, if that is the case, the very thing which has driven the legislation and has driven GIRFEC, driven the name person, which is early spotting of signs, um, then we're going way in the other direction. I wonder, if, is it overstated to say the danger of um, defensive practice, which would the practice you've got, it'd be worse than the practice we have currently. Does anybody? I, I think um, I, I agree with you entirely, and that was one of my fears. And it's not it's not that the practice we have would look much different from what is proposed. But I think when there's any refocus onto information sharing and the potential for workers to be, you know, uh, prosecuted or, or, or whatever for information sharing, there is a, a, inevitably a kind of pulling back, people maybe uh, um, not sharing enough. I think, um, I think certainly from my experience, the, when the named person was trialled in Glasgow, there was definitely a, a lack of information coming through from different resources and um, when it was abandoned the, the, the situation reverted to the information sharing that we have. I mean there are quite a lot of mechanisms for information sharing between health, police, you know if we have a referral that is of a concern and I know they say below child protection but very often it is the information sharing that makes us decide whether it is child protection or not. So the IRD process, uh, which is a tripartite discussion between police, health and social work, almost within 24 hours of the referral, from the information we get, we can either move to child protection or say, actually, no, it's a single agency response, whether that be health, social work or indeed the police. Would you, I mean, I think the point was made earlier about using people, the information and, and the skills that they have. The one that we don't particularly use well enough is education, and it's maybe there is going to be the biggest problem in terms of knowing what to share and what to share. I mean, I, I was a school teacher for a long period of time. You're seeing a child every day. You mm -hmm. actually can visibly see the deterioration in spotting the, you know, in frequent, in increased absence and so on. Mm -hmm. So when education always feels has been a, a critical place to spot the early signs, but how well integrated is it into this information sharing um, process and do you think that there may be a drawing back from from schools giving information if it's too formal? I think schools are just a wee bit wary about it. I, I think um, probably this time last year, maybe slightly earlier, I think they were freely um, sharing information and it was all about this basis of trying to get early help for uh, a child. Um, and I, I think they are very wary of it now, and it's building that back up so that the benefits of the information sharing um, are, are possible again. And the last question is, um, when you have competing interests between the parents or the carer and the young person, how are those managed? Because in most you know, the circumstances I'm thinking of, a young person, I mean, I, I know someone just now, it's an historic case, who confided in his social worker about low-level problems he was having within his family. And that immediately went back to the family, which compounded the abuse. And I wonder, you know, regardless of this legislation, are you confident that we understand the difference between the interests of the child and the broader interests of the family? Is, that, is it going to be helped by this legislation? I think that again comes down to the individual judgment of the practitioner. We, we had have situations where a young person, say, has wanted counselling because of some something and didn't want the school to know the name person. Um, and that is perfectly within, I think the child was 14, perfectly within their right. Um, 
I know we need to look way, way back to Gillock and the Gillock principle and about um, decision making of uh, young people in terms of their own rights and uh, we have to respect those. It's whether, um, it's not, I think it's just an individual basis. I don't think, again, there's one you know, formula that we can say, yet yeah, within every situation, it depends on what the situation is. Thank you. Travis, you wanted to come? Yeah, no, sir, thank you. Kavita, can I just ask Jenny, um, Jenny Brand, uh, further to your point to Joanne Lamont, um, your concern about schools, uh, that they're wary of sharing information, mm -hmm. that's not presumably within the school, that's to other agencies within other the local agencies, authority? Other agencies, yeah. And I think probably because, um, in some respects, this sort of bigger role that we have as a named person yeah. is a new one. Yeah. Um, and where we were told that we could freely share, mm. we did. Mm. Um, and now that that's kind of in question again, people are uh, a bit reluctant, understandably, and and want want to check with someone before they share um, that they are in fact doing the right thing. Although almost without question. Um, any cases I've been involved in, the teacher is wishing to do the right thing. Yeah, is sure. you know, it, it is about mm -hmm. helping, and it's definitely about the child putting the child at the centre, not necessarily parents, etc. Yeah, and look, if I'm overstating this mm -hmm. argument, just tell me. But mm -hmm. do, do you think if if we enshrine all this in law, that situation becomes more challenging? Um, the point that was made earlier on about lawyers starting to become involved and the need to legally check the position that a teacher may or may not find herself in. In other words, is this an improvement, or are we do what we have at the moment works effectively? I'm not, I'm not sure. No, I'm not, I don't mm -hmm. blame you for not being mm -hmm. sure. I'm not sure any of us mm -hmm. are sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just on on those last points there, uh, particularly around uh, the unwillingness to share because staff think that they may well be prosecuted. Really, what you're looking for here, I suppose, is reassurance that that's not going to be the case. And hopefully, at that point, then the staff will start to go back to what you were talking about uh, earlier on. But also, correct me if I'm wrong, but would there not need to be... The Code of Practice obviously has to help here, but ov obviously there has to be guidance and training in place to make sure that within the parameters that the, the staff are, are uh, confident about what it is they're doing. But will this thing... Will it not... Once it happens, if it happens, but does it not just bed in? I mean, major changes happen, but then, you know, a year down the line or whatever, you find that they, they're just part of, of what you do. I mean, it's, it's a serious question, I don't know, but I mean, we, we, you, you've, you've been through change before and thought it was horrific. That will be the reality. And it's just that initial refocus yeah. on information sharing that everybody kind of takes a step back and becomes a little more reticent about information. But, yes, the, the eventually it will um, embed into the system and the, they'll revert to what is the safest for children. Yeah. Um, sharing information is, uh, you know, long and weary, as uh, Joanne was saying. The, the notion that every agency has a piece of a jigsaw and we get the full picture when we put that information together. And that, you know, I know there's concerns about families' invasion in private life, but that, that piece can also be, you know, there's concerns in one agency, but actually the other pieces of the jigsaw ameliorate these concerns and we, you know, the agencies don't need to be involved in families' lives. It's not all about us um, finding a route to be involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, as we say, the, you don't have that invisible army of social workers just desperate to go into everybody's house to, to do stuff. OK, listen, thank you very much for your attendance today. That was a, a very useful session. I'll, sus I'll suspend for a moment or two to allow the witnesses to leave before continuing. Thank you very much.